The planet is heating up. The oceans are becoming filled with plastic. Change starts now. Change starts now. We're on a countdown to zero waste. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast. Here's your host, Laura Nash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ZWC. This week, we're speaking with Heather McMillan. She's from heathershearth.ca, and she makes sourdough bread, the best sourdough bread. Heather, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am excited to talk all about sourdough bread with you. It's been so fun making sourdough, and I used to make it years ago, but it wasn't really that great. And then I took Heather's course at MKC. So if you remember our episode from last week with Madawaska Canoe Center, I actually went up there in the fall and got to sit in one of Heather's uh, sourdough workshops, and it really took my sourdough game up and like many, many levels. So we're going to find out all about her course and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the science behind sourdough and why it's so cool. And uh, let's start with a little bit of the history, Heather. So when I did take your course, I remember you saying a little bit of uh, where it started. Like, I think, I think some of it was found that was like 4,000 years old or something. Uh, yeah, well, it would be even more than 4,000 years old because it would, it was like before our time period of a- AD, right? So the agriculture kind of started about 10,000 years ago, and that's when we would have started harvesting seeds from grasses, and then we started to um, actually cultivate them and grind them into flowers. Now, that would be like really, really primitive, right? Like they wouldn't have had the kind of milling uh, capacity that we have now, uh, but like grinding seeds into flour with rocks and stones and flatbreads are like a huge a huge tradition throughout the whole world and that is kind of like a flatbread right you don't have any rise or bubbles or anything in it but naturally the yeasts and bacteria that are part of they're in the grain and to some extent around us in the air but mostly from the grain and even from people's hands um, from mixing the dough like water and flour together everything is already there for the sourdough process to happen now these people at this time wouldn't have known anything about what is actually happening scientifically uh, but they might have noticed you know a bowl of their dough just sitting in a nice warm spot either by a fire or on a warm sunny day starting to rise and bubble and that would have been like the kind of like the birth of sourdough and now i don't think we have an exact time that we know from that that would have started happening probably would have started happening before we found evidence. But scientists have found remnants of sourdough bread and starters from over thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, which is pretty cool to hear about and, and discover. And I mean, sourdough has such a rich history, even in more recent times of, you know, people say, oh, I have a sourdough starter that my you know, my grandmother brought from Poland or where or wherever, Germany, uh, and we've taken care of it this whole time. So there's a really, really rich history of sourdough. And it's really neat to kind of think about where it came from and how we can continue to do that in our homes now. Yeah, I love how you can start it yourself, too, because before I took your course a couple of years ago, I just put some flour and water out on my deck in the springtime, and uh, it, it created a beautiful starter and you know what always it kind of keeps me up at night sometimes like how was how was yogurt first started like I I wonder if it was just sitting out in the sun in a bucket or something and someone came out and and saw it I don't know yogurt always uh always makes me think because sourdough is pretty easy to start yeah with a starter right well yogurt and um cheese were also like accidental kind of discoveries I know a little bit about it because um I worked on a farm that that milked raw milk cows. And I've had a cow before for myself, although I don't do it anymore. It's a lot of work. Um, But raw milk has all the bacteria and stuff in it that you need to create these things. Whereas we now drink pasteurized milk. So pasteurized milk just goes bad uh, because there aren't all the living, uh, living things in it like raw milk has. So I know that cheese was the story of cheese was discovered 
or maybe it was yogurt, I'm not sure, about more like a cheese, actually, because cheese needs rennet, which is an enzyme from a, a young um, animal's, ruminant animal's stomach. So people would use the stomachs of these young animals for carrying water or whatever they were drinking. And so this particular person in this story was carrying milk in their carrier and it turned into, it curdled, it turned into like a cheesy or yogurty thing. So it is actually very easy to make yogurt with raw milk or cheese or soft cheese or they call it, uh, there's a name for it. But anyways, it's all, yeah, it's it, it's so fascinating because this is all fermentation, right? It's all the same kind of interesting stuff. Like yogurt has lactobacillus bacteria in it and so does sourdough, right? That's where you get that like tangy, um, kind of sweet flavor from from your sourdough is oh. lactobacillus acid, the same thing. That's weird that it would be the same. You'd think dairy would have something different than just the flour and water. Yeah, well, they, they do have something different. So like when in my courses, I talk about sourdough starter, right? It has like multiple strains of yeast and bacteria. Now, m raw milk also has multiple strains of bacteria I'm not sure about yeast I don't I don't know that for sure although I imagine it does in it and just depending on the environment and how you treat the either the sourdough or the milk it will taste and taste differently so like one bacteria might be more dominant and that's what we have come to know yogurt as yogurt has a very specific flavor because we use specific strains of bacteria in it Whereas if you were to take raw milk and just let it sit out in the warm sun, and there's a name for this and I'm, I'm, it's escaping me, it will just naturally turn into like a yogurt-like consistency, but it will taste totally different than yogurt because whatever bacteria that's in that raw milk from that specific place and that specific cow from the specific grass and feed that it's eating will create its own like profile and uh, ecosystem of bacteria, And so that specific yogurt or whatever it is it's not called yogurt it's there's a name clabber the raw milk that you leave in the sun does clabber sound familiar yes that's it <laughs> clabbered milk yeah it's just regular raw milk you just yeah. let it sit and you let its natural bacteria do its own thing and it turns into like a yogurt consistency but it tastes different i've had it before i just couldn't remember the name it has the same consistency as yogurt, but it tastes totally different because it has different bacteria in it. And that, and you can manipulate sourdough in that way too. So like a whole grain sourdough starter. And maybe I should just, in case someone doesn't know what sourdough is on who's listening, sourdough is like the traditional ma way of making bread. It You take some flour and water and you mix it together and you let it ferment. Uh, and the yeast and bacteria that are in the grain and around on your hands and in the air will start to eat the carbohydrates that are available to them in the flour water mixture and that creates it's a fermentation process so it creates carbon dioxide and it also creates different um, acids organic acids uh, and then <clears throat> a few other more complicated things happening in there um, but really what it does is it helps rise your bread the gluten molecules form and the proteins and the carbon dioxide that's created makes bubbles in the dough um, and then it also contributes to the flavor and the texture and how the the dough <clears throat> works that's how bread was made until we started using i think it was in the 1800s where beer making was becoming really popular and they would use like the barm which is like the yeasty bubbles on the top of making beer and that had yeast in it so people started using that as a more isolated thing to rise their bread and then from there it developed into instant yeast which um instant yeast has only been around for about 150 years or so and that's what most people know you just shake that little the little specks of yeast into your bread and it's like bam it happens so quick and so fast and it's one strain of yeast there's no other bacterias or other yeasts in there because there's tons of different species of both of those things um, around and so yeah so sourdough is just it's a process people ask me like oh 
you know, I thought only sourdough was like this one type of white bread or maybe like the San Francisco sourdough because that's what people think of and know as a popular thing. I mean, sourdough is becoming way more popular now at home for people making it and stuff. So there's more of an understanding of, of it now in the general population, I think. But I think there's a lot of misconceptions still um, where I was like, well, you can make like, you know, a whole wheat loaf with sourdough bread or you can make um, cinnamon buns or you can make pizza. You don't have to just make a loaf of bread. You can make so many different things. Even cookies and cakes can be made with sourdough and cakes can still be sweet. They don't necessarily have to be sour. <laughs> you can make sweet breads with sourdough. So what was I saying before? Oh, yeah. So you can manipulate how sourdough tastes and the texture based on how you take care of your starter and what you feed it. And everyone's starter is going to be different. There are studies now showing that, say, I, I'm teaching a sourdough course and like you, Laura, took a sourdough starter of mine home. And I've had this one going for about 10 years or so. I, I created it myself and it's, it's moved a little bit. So every time it moves, it's going to change. And or, or if you switch what flour you feed it, what bacteria and yeast are in there will change a little bit. Uh, what the studies have shown is that some of those yeasts and bacteria that were in the st starter to begin with will stay the same, but others might drop off and new ones might, might pop in. So once you take a starter home or if you start your own starter, you have something that is like very, it's like the concept of terroir. It's like you have something that is very tied to your place and environment and time that you are taking care of that starter. So it's really cool because it kind of like adapts to to you and what you're what you're doing with it. Yeah. I remember you saying if you get your grandmother's starter, it might not actually be the same as it was like 90 years ago because you keep adding to it. And like you said, it changes kind of over time, but maybe there's still some left from, you know, if you've inherited. Yeah, I, I think I think there is. What I have read is that it does say that there could definitely potentially be the same, some of the same yeast or bacteria growing in in that starter from from when your grandmother was, you know, had it. But it might be different for every single different starter, right? You don't know unless you test it. And I honestly have never tested mine, but there are labs that do it. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the rising process. Like, what is it that switches the bread and tells the bread okay go <laughs> it's your time to rise up yeah. this is a part that I've actually screwed up and I had I had four loaves screw up in a row and I'll I'll, I'll tell you what I did wrong after actually because I figured it out and I'm really proud of figuring it out um but yeah t let's let's oh, talk yeah. about the rising process yeah so the rising process starts with your sourdough starter. The, the foundation of all baking for sourdough bread is from the starter. And if your starter isn't healthy, then, I mean, there's many steps along the way of baking sourdough that can be, I don't want to say screwed up, but you can get it wrong and it, it affects your outcome, right? So you have to pay attention to all the steps. And once you kind of like get a, a feel for it and you've done it enough times, then you can intuitively correct yourself or fix what you sometimes you can't fix the mistake that you made but you'll know what you did wrong um and so the rising process starts with a very healthy starter that's bubbly it doubles and double when i mean double so if you have a starter in a jar and you've you've just mixed it with flour and water and there's no bubbles in there yet you have to leave it in a warm place and let it bubble up and you want it to be able to bubble up to like more than double the height that it was at when you first mixed it and at least like five to six or eight up to eight hours now you'll get some like sourdough experts talking about tripling and stuff and it's great if your your starter triples in a certain amount of time and it's super active but i find that when you store your starter in the fridge which is what i recommend to everyone because otherwise you're going to be feeding your starter like two or three times a day which is just not manageable for most people. A starter that's stored in the fridge will not necessarily triple in a certain amount of time unless you you take it out and feed it on the counter for two or three days. 
Um, but if it's doubling and it's happy and it gets and it bubbles, um, that's great. And that's when you want to start. Then you use you use that sourdough starter that's just hit its peak. So its peak is when it doubles or or rises up to a certain point, and then it's just about to fall down when the bubbles start to pop. That's when the gluten starts to weaken and uh, it's not able to hold the bubbles anymore. So you add that sourdough starter into your dough and you're mixing like a Levant or a pre-ferment the night before you want to mix your final dough. There's lots of different ways to do this. This is just the way that I teach. Um, and you use that seed starter to mix into your leaven or Levant and it will rise overnight or about eight to 10 hours. And then you add that into your dough. What's happening is the yeast and bacteria that are in your starter are nice and active. They have lots of food to eat. Uh, that's what creates the rising. But you also have to have a flour that um, has enough gluten and you have to develop the gluten to hold the bubbles that are being created. So that's why like gluten-free bread, for example, you need to use starches to get any kind of light or fluffiness in it because um, starches are kind of like hold air as well. Whereas like, um, you know, sorghum or buckwheat flour, they just don't have any gluten in them. Gluten is protein. Two, there's two components to it that start to line up when you mix your dough. So when you're mixing your dough together, either by hand or with a mixer, you are lining up the proteins for gluten. Now, gluten can also kind of do that on its own. That's part of the sourdough baking process. There's a lot of hands-off time when you just are leaving the dough to sit in the auto lease, which is like a sp special time period between mixing and adding salt, or just in between stretching and folding it. So there's, there's different ways to develop that gluten. Some of it's hands-on and some of it's hands-off and, and the yeast and bacteria uh, specifically, some of the acids that are produced from the fermentation help to develop that gluten. So it's like this dance between um, gluten formation and development and the, the carbon dioxide being uh, um, created in the fermentation from your starter that you have added into your dough. So just the flour and water. Um, and also heat. It needs heat. The bacteria and yeast that are Living in your sourdough starter need a very warm temp, not super, super hot, but very warm temperature um, in the like mid 20 degrees Celsius range up to even 30 degrees. I like to bake when it's a little bit less than 30 degrees. It's hard to control <laughs> the bubbles when it's that hot, but the heat really helps the yeast and bacteria proliferate and grow. So what was happening with mine is I was leaving it out on the, the counter for about three hours. So after I had rolled and shaped it, then I would just kind of let it sit there for a few hours and then pop it right into the oven and it wouldn't rise. And so what I started thinking is I went back and looked through your book and I saw that you could put it in the fridge uh, for up to 24 hours. So after you get it all rolled and shaped and it's ready, you know, you can leave it in the fridge for up to 24 hours. And then I remembered when I came back from MKC from your course, you told me to put uh, put the bread in a cooler with ice. And I thought that was very strange because I know that you want warm temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I ended up doing to fix the problem was I just kept it in the fridge overnight. So for about 12 hours, and then I took it directly from the cold fridge and popped it into the hot, hot oven. And every single time mm -hmm. it rises perfectly and is nice and light and fluffy. It's a, it's a tricky thing. So ambient room temperature baking is when you keep it out in a warm area after shaping and then bake it into the, put it into the oven. And it is, in some ways it's harder than just putting your bread into the fridge and then baking it later. As long as you've done all the steps up to that point correctly to then put it in the fridge, then it, you'll, ha you'll have beautiful loaves ambient room temperature you really have to keep an eye on how fast it's rising after you shape it you might have let it rise too much i don't know if there were bubbles in your bread but if you let it rise too much and overproof it then it certainly will not rise because the the gluten has weakened and the bubbles are just not being held in the bread and won't rise also when your bread is cold colder 
Carbon dioxide expands more, and I don't know the sci exact science behind why this is. Carbon dioxide expands more when you go from a cold environment to a very hot environment. So you can technically get a bigger rise from a loaf that's been in the fridge overnight than from a, a loaf that has been sitting on the counter. Now, technically, if you're a really, really good baker and you have lots of experience, you will know how to get that really good rise from an ambient <clears throat> room temperature bake. But for beginners, I find it's a lot easier to do it from the fridge. And, and it's good to do both because you can learn a lot of things from both methods. But I find also it, putting loaves in the fridge just it helps with scheduling and around busy lives and, and knowing kind of figuring out when to bake your bread. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're right, because the schedule takes a long time. So so this morning, I had some sourdough and eggs from my chicken. So I make my own sourdough, get some eggs from the chickens, and have a nice breakfast. And then I started my starter. So I took it out of the fridge and fed it, and then I'm going to feed it tonight. And then tomorrow morning, I'll make that levain, and then I'll make the bread all day. And then at the end of the day, when it's all ready, I'll pop it in the fridge so that in two mornings from now, I can pop the bread in the oven and it'll be ready really quickly, like for that morning. So yeah, you're right. It is like a, like the timing part is really fun to get, like depending on when you want the bread ready, right? Yeah. I, I think that sometimes intimidates people when they first think about starting to do sourdough is there, it isn't just an easy one, two, three, that's it process. And it does take some time to learn and figure out and I like to think that my courses at least give people the confidence to get going and try because having that little base instruction and support at the beginning is really good. And then you you figure it out from there. I, I, I honestly don't think that sourdough bread baking is for anyone who just can't figure something out on their own. You have to like experiment and practice and, and you really learn from doing it, right? You can't read all the books first and then you, you're an expert you have to physically get going and and doing it but yeah having the fridge mm. is such a an asset for you don't have to bake it right away you know you can bake it the next day or you can even leave it in the fridge for two days and, and it's probably going to be fine um, and you'll be able to bake it when it suits you after committing to the time to get to that point mm -hmm. so Probably my favorite part about sourdough is that I don't need any plastic. So, of course, this is a zero waste show. And I've tried not to go too much into packaging lately just because I feel really bad for restaurants who have been mm -hmm. ordered shut by the government. And so I think it's nice to, like, support those people, you know, even if there is a little bit of garbage produced. So I'm just not really focusing on packaging too much lately. But with the sourdough, I don't have to keep it in plastic. And I don't know if you do this or if anyone listening does this, but I just bake the bread and then I let it cool. Like I'll eat some of it, let it cool. And then I just tip it on a plate on the, the side that I've cut. So I just put that down. And mm -hmm. then I usually have it for toast every morning, um, but it's still good fresh. Like it's still soft um, like days later. So it's pretty amazing that I, I, I figured out how to finally get bread without plastic bags. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm not nearly as diligent as you, although I have tried multiple things. A lot of my bread gets frozen if I have like leftover bread from I bake for for to sell bread and I often have to put it into plastic bags for because of like farmers market rules and uh, uh, the one that I go to anyways. But yeah, you can keep it in pla or paper bags. You can even um, use bees wrap to wrap it up. I've I've had lots of good feedback from people using bees wrap bags around their bread, and it keeps it fresh. And I find that if I keep a loaf of bread on the counter, it does get a pretty crusty uh, quickly, not as soft. Maybe uh, that's awesome that you find it to be soft. I mean, it just depends on your what you like, right? Like crusty or bread is delicious yeah. and if you're toasting it anyways it doesn't matter but yeah you can literally make your own sourdough pretty much completely without plastic and then not have to put it into a plastic bag which is great um, or if you're freezing some you can reuse your plastic bags you know uh, it doesn't you don't have to throw it out right away mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's been really great uh, for that way and I've been trying 
like for years to make good bread. I even bought a bread machine. I tried sourdough before and like I hadn't taken your course. So I, I was missing some steps, I think. Like it was, it just wasn't nearly as good. But now that I, I took your course and then I started screwing up again. Like I made four in a row that didn't rise and it was really frustrating. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't, I can't give up. I've been like four years of trying to make good bread. And then yeah. I spent so many years not making good bread. Like I learned to bake at a lodge out in BC. I was there just for a month working as a cook. And I, that was when I discovered sourdough. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I've never seen anything like this before. And I left that place having learned a little bit, but not enough. And I just tried so many times to bake bread and it just never turned out how I wanted it to. And now you make, like, didn't you say you could make like 200 loaves in a day or something crazy? Yeah, I do. Um, or I can. Wow. I have an outdoor wood-fired oven that holds about 30 loaves, 24 to 30 or so loaves, depending on the size and type of bread. And I can bake in it all day long. So the heat holds from the fire the day before and I can rotate lots of bread in and out of there in a day. How do you get the temperature right? Did somebody build this for you? Like, what does it look like? Is it on your Instagram? Yeah, there's some photos of it on my Instagram, uh, mostly just of the inside or of me firing it. Uh, I now have a brick masonry oven and the floor of the oven is rectangular and there's like a dome on top and it's quite um, shallow, like it's not very tall, I guess you would say. And it's surrounded by heat mass and insulation. So the heat mass is a concrete, a special kind of refractory concrete that holds heat really well. And then the outside uh, on top of that, there's a ton of insulation around it so that the heat that is held in to the heat mass doesn't escape out. And so that heat from the fire, I've, I'll fire it all day long on the day before I want to bake. And all the heat from the fire just gets absorbed into the bricks and to the refractory concrete and then is held there by the insulation. And it balances itself out. So in this oven that I have now, um, my partner Pat built pretty much for all of it for me. I don't think I helped much with this one. I previously baked in two cob ovens, which are made out of natural clay materials. And I helped with all of the, the building of those two. But this one I... I didn't, but there's thermocouples in certain places in the oven, which take the temperature of the dome and the floor of the, the oven and certain other places. And I mostly just use one reading, which is the top of the dome for figuring out, you know, it's a good temperature. Um, so I can keep an eye on that when I'm firing. And then I can keep an eye on that the next morning when I look at it. But pretty much I've just Create, I've just developed a routine. I know how many hours to fire. I know what temperature I want to get it up to. I, I know how many coals I want to leave in the evening when I close up the doors. I know when to clean it out so that it's the right temperature for when my breath. It's like, it's just been years of developing like these little routines of knowing when to do what. And I am not, I do not always make it perfect. Sometimes the oven might be a little bit too hot and I'll be, have to be very careful not to burn bread. Or, you know, my bread will be ready too soon to go in and I have to like figure something out. I also learned a lot about just reading the oven without temperature when I was baking in my cob ovens, which really didn't hold heat as well. They weren't as stable. This oven is really stable. The heat, it's heat stable. Once you get it up to a certain temperature, the amount of heat that comes back into the oven is happens at a, a pretty consistent rate. The heat coming from the floor and the, the roof of it or the dome is pretty consistent. So I'm not like burning bottoms, but not having like the top cooked enough or whatever. So it's like very even heat overall. But it is not an easy thing. It is not like turning on an oven, like a, a gas or electric oven and saying 450 or 500 and just throwing bread in there. It's certainly been a skill that I has been, I've been developing for years to figure it out. <laughs> That's very cool. I always think of my, my grandmother 
They got electricity, I think, in the early 60s. And before that, they didn't have it because they're on a farm in Canada. And my dad says that my grandma used to use different sticks of wood, like different types for cooking in the summer because there is wood that doesn't give off nearly as much heat like certain kinds of wood and of course you know they definitely didn't have air conditioning if <laughs> that was a long time away um, <laughs> if they didn't have electricity so uh, they were and and you know they had to cook in the summer when and it could be plus 30 plus 35 celsius and so the temperature of the oven was very important like tweaking it right because they would have had i guess those old wood stoves whereas yours is built like in a whole different room is it like is is this like an out room, it's actually outside we built it in yeah. a shipping container that it's just outside of my house um because we were renting a farm for a while oh, wow. and we moved we actually moved it with a crane and a, and a truck and but you can build them inside. You certainly wouldn't want one in your house. It's humongous. But uh, there are wood fired ovens that are inside bakeries. And it's funny actually. The the wood fired ovens do not contribute that much heat to the actual room because the fire is so contained and it, it absorbs all the heat. Um, that you're not. It's not like a cook Ooh. stove like your grandmother or like we have a cook stove in our kitchen. I don't use it to cook very often. But that really heats your house up, right? Because it's like a stove. It's like a wood fireplace. Um, that's why lots of people would have like a summer kitchen, which would be maybe like a a little outbuilding beside your house where instead of firing your cook stove inside during the summer, you would go and cook outdoors so you wouldn't boil yourself <laughs> with the heat. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I do that now with like barbecues, right? I'll I'll put things on the barbecue a lot more in the summer because I don't want to go out in the freezing cold so much and do it anyway in the winter. But yeah. I don't want to heat my house up either with the oven, so I hardly ever use my electric oven in the in the summer. I like to eat seasonally too, so it's fun to just change change things up. And I feel like it could be healthy for you when you look at the the gut microbiome uh, because if you think of throughout history of humans we've always ate things in season so like you'll eat a whole bunch of berries for like a few weeks and then you won't see berries for the rest of the year or you'll eat you know apples in the fall and then you know they'll run out and then you don't eat anymore i don't know i found one scientific article on it that they they were measuring how your your gut flora and fauna goes up and down depending on the different things you eat like in different seasons and so i find that fascinating like are we supposed to be eating the same things every day or is it okay to like eat lots of things in one season i don't know i'm pretty nerdy into like gut health stuff like sourdough bread is Me like too. better for your gut than regular bread and even then people have like i've had my ups and downs with gluten sensitivity actually personally which is pretty funny because i'm a baker but yeah it's really fascinating i really feel more now I mean, we farm grass-fed beef and we make, raise our own chickens too. So like we, and we, we garden. And so we have like this whole, that whole thing going on. And I really find that at certain times of the year, I, I don't really want to eat like a ton of fruit or um, like even greens right now. I'm not really eating that many greens because the stuff in the grocery store sucks and I don't have like that much, I don't have it place to buy local greens right now that taste good so I just don't eat them <laughs> and I don't I don't eat smoothies so and I don't so I don't put a bunch of that stuff in my smoothie I eat eggs for breakfast and so yeah I, I agree I think it's I think it's fascinating and there's like way more studies coming out about the microbiome because really that's like one of the things that we totally don't understand about the human body and mm -hmm. there's more studies happening too about sourdough bread and the microbiome as well um not a nearly an, as an, enough i think because like gluten has been really um demonized in the past five ten years and the funny thing is is that a lot of the gluten-free products that are coming out are just as processed and just as crap as so much of the wheat products that it's just i find it ironic and hilarious but not hilarious like it's too bad. Like people shouldn't be just moving into a gluten-free diet and eating all these processed, this processed crap, you know? I make a gluten-free bread, sourdough bread now that's really good. And it has some starches and stuff in it, but 
it's pretty robust and healthy and tastes good. It doesn't taste like the gluten-free bread that you buy in the grocery store. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point that you make. I remember somebody said, if the food product has to tell you why it's good for you, it's probably not good for you. So like if you see all the packaged food, it's like high in fiber, low in fat, low in sugar, like all these things, right? It's like, oh, you know, that sounds great. But when you go and look at the potatoes and broccoli and stuff in the produce section, they just, it's like broccoli, one ninety nine or something. Like it doesn't say <laughs> that it's, it's high in in these vitamins and minerals and stuff like that, it just like never does. And I thought that was really funny. And, and I grew up in the late nineties when everybody was saying that fat was bad for you. And then I read a book, French women don't get fat. It was called, and it was funny. It's like a lighthearted, funny kind of thing about really, really good, rich foods. Like in France, like they use heavy cream and they drink wine and they enjoy food so much and they're pretty healthy and, and all these sorts of things. And I never really bought the no fat stuff. And when you look at, let's say a yogurt, for example, because we talked about that a lot on the show and it says, you know, zero fat yogurt, um, but it's probably got a lot of sugar and maybe some preservatives and a bunch of other stuff. Like you're saying the, the fillers and whatever, right? Cause you're trying to make it taste good when all the fat's gone. Um, so I just never subscribed to the zero fat stuff. I always ate lots of fatty foods and I'm I think I'm pretty healthy so far. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same. I've always eaten fat and I I think I eat even more fat now, like animal fats. And I think, yeah, I'm pretty healthy. I'm also not fat. I mean, that there's lots of factors and I don't want to don't want to get into that. But there, there's a lot of health washing out there and it's really complicated. <laughs> but that's like and that's why like with sourdough, I just like I want people to still be able to eat bread if if that's what they want they want to eat bread then eat the best bread you can and if you can make it for yourself then that's that's the best choice you can do because if you understand a process and how long it takes and you enjoy it and you're like wow I did this you know like you screwed up four loaves in a row and it was so frustrating but you learned from that and then you you went on to bake really good bread afterwards so you you appreciate what you are eating. And it's so simple. Like it's just flour and water and salt, which is amazing. So I can go, uh, Upper Canada Village has this like stone ground flour, um, Bellamy's Mills, I think. And it was really expensive. So I'm looking for cheaper flour, <laughs> but it was cool. So I bought this giant bag. It's like half as tall as I am. So a really big bag of flour. And I've just been going through that. And then I bought a giant uh, bucket of salt. I never have to drive anywhere for bread, which is nice. Like I try and keep my, my going to a grocery store or anything like that down to a minimum. So of course, with all the stuff we grow uh, in the garden, and then I, I preserved a bunch of it and put it in the cold storage so we can go down to our own little grocery store all winter long and pull out some nice healthy veggies. And then I've got the nice healthy bread going and our chickens provide lots of eggs sometimes we get up to seven eggs a day and uh yeah we're, we're doing pretty well staying staying home and kind of eating the our own stuff which you're right it does make you feel really good like you're kind of in in control of things and then of course a big part of this was all for me to get rid of the plastic because the grocery stores would just sometimes it would make me really sad when I would see a other other carts like full of you know water bottles and they'll they'll take one pepper and put it in a plastic bag and i i'm not mad at people or anything like that it's just they don't uh they don't know and plastic is very useful and stuff so yeah i just try to avoid the grocery stores and for many reasons right for many reasons yeah but yeah. So, so I just wanted to ask you though, about the, the, mic the microbiome and the bread, like, do you know why it's so good for us? Is it because it's still living in the bread and then it feeds things in our gut? Um, I think there's a bit of studies about that and I'm not very well versed on it, but the main thing that I know of, and this is like, there aren't enough scientific studies to prove all of this stuff yet, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence from customers, like people who eat bread, that sourdough bread, and there's multi-factors coming into this. So in the process of fermentation, 
like I told you earlier, the gluten forms and it lines all it lines up and gluten is a protein. It's a lectin for people that are like nerding out on lectin stuff, like gut biome stuff. Lectins are things in plants. So are phytic acids. They're in seeds and plants, mostly, mostly in seeds, but they're in other plants, like other fruits and stuff as well. They're, they're the plant's defense mechanism. Okay. They're there to protect them. And once the seed germinates, these things are transformed. Uh, but when they're in the seed form, like, so a, a wheat kernel is a seed, right? It, you can plant it and it will grow. Before it germinates, you don't, it doesn't want anything to get at it or wreck it or eat it or whatever. So it has these components like the phytic acid and lectin or gluten, which is a, a lectin in them. And those things have been proven to not be digest very easily digestible to humans. They do, they can do damage to our gut lining. And so when you are making sourdough, these things are broken down through long fermentation. The There's like a balance between developing the gluten and also breaking down some of the gluten as well as the phytic acid in the seeds or in the flour. And so with the process of sourdough, you're reducing the punch that gluten can give to your gut. And there's also the other thing about sourdough baking is once you get into whole grains and heritage grains, you'll get to know more about grains that have not been changed through hybridization, which is like a breeding term for plants like modern wheat has. There's a lot of other things you can get into, like glyphosate. So I only use organic flour and I, only, I recommend that everyone use just organic flour. The amount of spraying that happens now on wheat and other grains at the end of its growing life just before they harvest is is crazy you think that like buying produce that's been grown in a field that was maybe sprayed with glyphosate just to kill the weeds before growing is bad um think about them being sprayed by roundup just before harvest so they're all over the seed they're all over the kernel and then it gets cleaned and shipped yeah. out to a mill and then milled into your flour. There's so many things saying that like all the bad things that glyphosate can do in our bodies. So it's not a good thing to have. Yeah. They spray it to dry it. I think, right. It can like boost the yield really quickly. It, it, it makes the plant think that it's going to die, which it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it'll, it'll give like one extra energy boost to maybe like increase the yield a tiny bit before the plant dies yeah it's not good to have that stuff in in you right i didn't uh, i didn't know that so you think that organic flour doesn't contain glyph glyphosate well there's always a chance that there's a contamination of it um, and i know that there have been studies of like canadian chickpeas that are organic being tested for glyphosate and then and then having some in it because glyphosate's everywhere now but in the organic standards like Certified organic products, grain products, uh, pulses like beans and like dried beans and lentils and stuff, they are not allowed to do that. Like it's not allowed within the organic standards. So if they're certified organic, you're buying certified organic flour. I mean, I really hope that we can be confident that there isn't glyphosate on it because that is what those farmers are following the rules from the organic standards. Yeah, that's good so, to know. And then that and that's so, another reason to get to know who your farmer and miller is. So like there are some local like you said you were buying um flour from Upper Canada Village. Now I don't know where they're buying their grain from or I don't think they grow it there, but just knowing more of the supply chain and of where your things are coming from shorten if it's shorter then you have more confidence of what is in your food. Besides the fact that the sourdough is a positive for your gut and compared to regular bread, the negatives from the, the, the regular bread is just like way more. So that's why I just, I just don't think mm -hmm. people are eating any other bread except for organic sourdough.
Yeah, it's crazy when you pick up a loaf of bread at the grocery store and see all the ingredients on it. Or if you go and buy like some tortillas in a bag, like from a big company, right? If you flip it over and look at the ingredients, there's like 20 ingredients in it. And it's, it's stuff I can't pronounce. I don't quite know what it is. Like, why am I eating this? It's just for the company to make a profit so it can stay on the shelf longer. Really, it's not anything that makes it healthier. I don't think maybe some of the things are added to make it healthier, but I think a lot of it's just uh, preservatives. And so I just love that this is just flour, water, and salt. And uh, do you have a do you have a brand like in your area? Because you're in the Ottawa area, right? Like a, a yeah. brand of flour that you would recommend? Like even just the PC Organics all-purpose flour is really good. Um, I've noticed lately, even in Renfrew, we have like um a nice organic or natural product aisle in our grocery store now. And I found Anita's Organics flour, which is a stone mill from BC. And uh, they have a really nice whole wheat flour. There's a business called Almanac Grain that started maybe a year and a half ago that's based in Ottawa that does all whole grain flours. Now they've been closed for a while because they were getting a new mill and now they're just about to open soon. Um, and then uh, the farmer that another farmer that I get flour from I think he's going to be starting an online store soon as well he's in the Gananoque Kingston area and there's another mill in southern Ontario called 1847 all of these places all of these places ship now it's crazy like you can you have to buy a certain amount of flour and you'll get free shipping like $80 or $100 but flour is very heavy to ship uh, so to be able to order flour say you live I think you live in near Kingston area? Yeah, I live kind of in between Belleville and Kingston. Yeah, so to be able to even order from Ottawa and get it shipped to your, to your house is pretty great. I, To be honest, I have not been able to find an easily available organic bread flour specifically, um, but I, ha I find that the all-purpose from PC Organics is good enough to make bread with as long as you have some like whole grains stone ground wheat flour to go with it which is part of my recipe that I give to people in the workshop anyways so yeah the workshop was amazing so I couldn't believe that you provided the bowls you provided the Levain already mixed you gave us a sourdough starter and a nice little mason jar and uh, everything was there for us and you worked your butt off um, I remember the lunch being super good we had fresh bread and soup uh, it was just a really amazing course and I think it's rare that you show up to a course and are, are taken care of so well like it was just it was really great I really appreciated it I learned a lot and uh, it was very hands-on literally you literally have your hands <laughs> in the bowl of dough <laughs> so it was uh, it was just great. So if anyone's listening in the area, can you tell us a little bit about how to find you and if you're ever going to offer these courses again? Yeah, I'm definitely going to offer courses again as soon as we are able to. I So I live in the Ottawa Valley near Renfrew, Ontario and Pembroke. And I've had people travel as far as east side of Ottawa, Kingston, um, and then I think even from, you know, Halliburton area, I live about an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes northwest of Ottawa. And I have been running these workshops for a couple of years. I'm going to keep doing them once we're able to. I have more, more uh, tools and equipment to like reduce sharing for like COVID friendly stuff. And I ran two workshops in November that were, went really well. And I also run an online course. You can purchase my online course and in there you have full video instructions of how to bake sourdough bread, everything we go through in the in-person workshops, as well as pizza and, and focaccia. So if you aren't in my area, if you can't make it to a workshop when I do start running them again, I have that up and going all the time as well. And uh, yeah, you can find me at my website, heathershearth.ca. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook with the same, same handle. And probably the best way to keep in touch with me is to follow me on social media, or you can sign up for my email. Uh, and I always give the information to those people first about workshops that are coming up and 
and everything. So I'm really hoping this spring we can do some um, either at Madawaska Canoe Center again or another location that I'm keeping my eye out on in our prior. So we'll see about that. But yeah, I cannot wait to teach in person again. It's one of my favorite things to do. I, I guess it did look like I was super busy doing them, but and I am, but I it's fun. It's so fun to teach people in person. That's awesome. Yeah, you did a great job. And and if someone just wants to buy your bread, uh, did, did you mention where you are? I think you do like some markets and stuff, right, in the summer? Yeah, right now I'm just doing, well, I was off for a little bit. Um, my son was at home with me and I can't bake. <laughs> I don't have to much childcare, but he's back at school now. And, um, I'm baking twice a week. I do some deliveries into Ottawa. All that information is also on my website and you can see where I go with my bread. And, uh, I guess the only thing we really didn't touch on was the scoring part. So Heather is an artist when it comes to scoring. And that just means taking a sharp kind of razor or a knife and like making designs around it so usually when you make sourdough you're supposed to cut some little scratches in the top so that I guess it doesn't have wild bubble shapes I would assume that's why but anyway Heather has some really beautiful designs she's really talented in making the loaf look really beautiful uh, from the top oh thank you (laughs) there are some pretty amazing scoring artists out there on Instagram that are better than me but I it is fun to do that's why you do it, right? So that it doesn't go into a crazy, like, bubble? Uh, yeah. So, like, if you don't score your bread, it will break open wherever the weakest point in the dough is. And so with scoring, you can uh, control where it does that break open. And then you get that nice, like, bloom or rise out of your bread where you want it. And traditionally or historically, when people were baking in community ovens... So like one town would have one oven where you would bring your dough to bake every week or maybe even every day, depending. You would have your your personal family score on your bread so that you knew which bread coming out of the oven was yours. (laughs) Well, it's a wonderful thing, I think, sourdough. And I'm really happy that I, I have bread now that I don't need packaging. I don't have to drive half an hour into town to buy bread. I can just make it all here and enjoy it. And uh, it was, uh, it's been really great speaking with you, Heather. So thanks for taking us on the sourdough journey through this episode. That was awesome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It was fun to, to chat. That was Heather McMillan from heathershearth.ca talking all about sourdough. Change starts now. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast.